Right. Uh, thanks so much. I'd like to thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity to uh, present some of our recent work. Uh, since this is a conference partly to honor some of Pierce's contributions to Condensed Matter, I kind of changed my uh, title here to talk about you know, some aspects of heavy fermion physics and frustrated magnetism. I guess Pierce has kind of has interests in both these, and he's you know, contributed a lot uh, in collaboration with uh, long-term collaborators like Premi, uh, who's here in the audience. Uh, and so what I wanted to, uh, he's also had a lot of influence on the field through his pedagogical lectures and his textbook, and I couldn't resist sharing a little Facebook post I had when he advertised his uh, many body book a couple of years ago. And uh, so he's, uh, so it's been kind of, uh, learned a lot from uh, his stuff. So, so what I'll talk about today is, uh, you know, is really thinking about what happens to magnetism uh, when we get close to a mod transition. Uh, and we'll see that this has kind of connections to uh, two things that I'll uh, discuss in the talk. Uh, but for motivation, it's useful to think about uh, the triangular lattice organic materials on which uh, there have been a number of uh, experiments where people can induce a mod transition by uh, using pressure to go from an insulating phase uh, into a metallic phase. Uh, and depending on the kind of organic uh, material one uh, studies, one finds a variety of phases where you could either be uh, inside a magnetically ordered phase at ambient pressure, and then you pressurize it, and it enters a conducting phase beyond some critical pressure. Or in uh, some of these organics, this mod insulating phase, which has no magnetic order, this paramagnetic phase, gets pushed all the way down to zero temperature, resulting in uh, what seems to be a spin liquid uh, ground state, which you can then, again, pressurize and drive through a mod transition. Uh, so, so the question is, you know, so there are various possible sequences for what happens to uh, the spins as you do this, as you apply pressure, for instance, you could go from, as in one of these cases, from an ordered phase into possibly through some kind of first order transition into a conducting phase, or you could have novel magnetic orders or have some kind of intervening uh, spin liquid. So the spins can do various things uh, and seems to depend uh, to some extent on uh, the, what the material properties are. And uh, at least one of the driving forces uh, for possible novel forms of magnetism or uh, spin liquid uh, is the recognition that you, know, you, you not only have to deal with two spin interactions, which are progressively probably getting longer ranged uh, as you go towards the metallic phase, uh, but also that you're getting many body uh, exchange interactions between spins uh, as they are being driven into this phase where they're going to completely delocalize. Uh, so there have been kind of number of studies of uh, this, uh, motivated partly by the organics, but even motivated partly from experiments looking at uh, helium-3 on uh, graphite, uh, going back to work from uh, Claire Luria's group and uh, Gregoire Miskwich, where they had done some diagonalization studies, but uh, there's been uh, work on effective spin Hamiltonians by uh, Lesik Martinich uh, many years ago, and a very recent uh, preprint from a Berkeley group uh, where they've actually done DMRG on a Hubbard model, where again, they, as they go from, uh, uh, take this fermion Hubbard model and do DMRG, it looks like there is some kind of an intervening phase uh, that they tentatively, I think, identify as a chiral spin liquid phase, but it's kind of, uh, at this point, uh, I think one needs to understand some of these results better. So, so the two questions that I would like to kind of ask in this talk, which are kind of related, are first, you know, could such kind of physics also play a role uh, in heavy fermion systems, and I'll kind of give you some motivation for why uh, that might be interesting to uh, think about. Uh, and the second is, uh, you know, uh, going back to uh, what I just mentioned of the organics, but uh, thinking about, you know, other types of uh, spin liquids uh, that might be driven by multiple spin interactions, and in particular, can one relate, uh, in some of these cases, we find that we can sort of relate these spin liquids to some kind of uh, interesting magnetically ordered phases, and that will be kind of the second half of the talk. Okay. So, so let me begin with the first part, and this is sort of an ongoing uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Young, my colleague Young Beck at Toronto, uh, Sangbin at uh, KAIST, and uh, Young Beck's uh, student, Adarsh Patri. Uh, and I've uh, been collaborating uh, quite extensively also with uh, Simon Trebst and his two students are Frederick and Jan, so I'll present some numerical results which uh, they've actually obtained 
uh, during the course of this collaboration. And we benefited a lot from discussions with uh, Satoru Nakatsuji and uh, Kita Sakai. Uh, so this is just some uh, people, you know, a couple of them are out on the archive and a couple of them uh, which are in preparation. So, so what is the conventional way to think about sort of the heavy fermion uh, systems goes back to very early work by uh, Doniak where the point is you want to think about some local moments coupled to conduction electrons. And if this interaction between conduction electrons and the local moments is weak, then you imagine integrating out the conduction electrons and asking what happens to the local moment degrees of freedom. And typically you'll get some kind of two body RKKY interaction driving some form of magnetic order. Uh, and then as you keep increasing pressure, uh, eventually the spins completely hybridize with the conduction electron. And at that point, it's no longer legitimate to say I'm going to integrate out the conduction electrons. That's no longer a meaningful thing to do when we are on this side of the phase diagram. Uh, and so the point is that you know, there is this transition then between a magnetically ordered small Fermi surface state and this fully hybridized uh, large Fermi surface state. And it has been proposed by a number of people, uh, including uh, Catherine, who's here in the audience, that one can think of this transition in terms of a mod transition of the F electron. So you say that you know, on this side, it's, uh, it's as if the F electrons are, have become kind of metallic by hybridizing. Uh, and here, they have become localized, and they've done something ordered or done something else. Okay. Uh, so, so here, I mean, we were kind of started to think about this motivated by uh, experiments from uh, Nakatsuji's group on this class of heavy fermion uh, systems. So these are uh, uh, systems where uh, praseodymium uh, has a 4F2 uh, local uh, moment degree of freedom, and it's coupled with this complex set of conduction electrons coming from uh, transition metals and uh, aluminiums that kind of form these cages around the, the local moment uh, degrees of freedom. And the condo coupling is, of course, doing various things in the problem. It's going to scatter the electrons. Uh, in general, if you go to lower temperature, this might lead to various things, such as possibly ordering of these local moments, or this, it might nucleate uh, new types of metallic and or superconducting uh, phases. Uh, and uh, one of the important things to understand is sort of what is happening, at least in this class of compounds. Hopefully, that will shed some light on uh, the physics. So, so these systems, uh, one starts with so the local moment degree of freedom is this uh, 4F2 uh, ion, which has an uh, orbital angular momentum phi and a spin angular momentum 1, which gets spin orbit coupled into a j equal to 4 uh, spin degree of freedom. And the crystal field splits this uh, multiplet uh, giving rise to a low energy doublet, which is separated from all these excited multiplets by about uh, 60 Kelvin uh, energy gap. And this low energy doublet is a non Kramer's doublet because this is a 4F2 ion. It's a non Kramer's doublet, uh, which uh, you can sort of write down uh, explicitly in terms of these uh, angular momentum uh, components. Or one can write down effective uh, pseudo spin half degrees of freedom, uh, which for reasons that will, you know, for just, just notational convenience, we've kind of chosen to work with spin up and spin down, uh, being these superpositions of this particular uh, combination of doublets that I've written here. Okay. Uh, so the interesting thing here is that uh, unlike uh, typical uh, Kramer's doublet degrees of freedom, this one has the x and y, tau x and tau y, the pseudo spin components, uh, act as a, a quadrupolar degree of freedom. Uh, so they're even under time reversal. Uh, and they have various lattice transformations that I'll touch upon later. Uh, whereas the Z component of these uh, pseudospin acts uh, is, uh, has a non-zero octopole uh, moment, so it's actually odd under time reversal. Okay. So there have been a number of experiments on these systems, in particular by changing the transition metal ions. So for instance, here is data on uh, titanium, where as a function of temperature, they find when they cool the system, they find a single phase transition into uh, a state which has been identified as having ferro quadrupolar order. So this is the tau xy component of the pseudospin ordering into a ferro, ferro state. Uh, in this case, uh, when they replace titanium by uh, vanadium, uh, they find uh, uh, that there are two you know, fairly closely spaced transitions. Uh, and it turns out that here they've identified that the quadrupolar order is not ferro order, it's some kind of anti ferro order, the precise details of which uh, are not yet known from the experiments at this point. Uh, so, so that's uh, what is known. And, and one of the you know, uh, signatures that at least that the second compound, uh, 
Uh, the vanadium one is probably closer to this critical or to this phase transition from uh, and this kind of weak hybridization to the song hybridization that you're closer to that comes from some signatures which is still kind of, I think, a little bit uh, tentative is they've identified signatures in the resistivity where there is something that looks like a square root T uh, behavior which they kind of identify as possibly arising from two-channel condo. I think it's still a little bit uh, unclear to me because it's over a limited range in temperature and the sign at least is not like the single ion condo sign of the square root. It's a positive coefficient, so it's not entirely clear uh, you know, how to interpret this uh, data at this point. Uh, but that's at least a tentative uh, thing that they have kind of uh, highlighted in their experimental work. Uh, so the question that uh, we would like to ask is the following. So let's imagine that we are somehow on this uh, side of the transition where it's legitimate to in integrate out the conduction electrons. You want to ask what happens if I start deep uh, in the magnetically ordered side and kind of march towards the phase transition into the metallic large Fermi surface side, you would expect exactly as in the organics, you should expect that if these Fs are on the verge of delocalizing, then these F moment interactions should also become progressively more complicated as you get closer and closer uh, to this transition into delocalization. Right? And so what you would expect is that one must go beyond uh, simple RKKY type interactions and look at sort of possibly more complex types of uh, Hamiltonians. Uh, and I'll turn to sort of reasons why this uh, might be the case. Okay, so, so for instance, the simplest kind of terms you might write down in the hope of describing some of these uh, experiments is to say, well, I'm going to integrate out the conduction electrons and write down the simplest symmetry allowed Hamiltonian on the diamond lattice, which is where these local moments live, and the simplest Hamiltonian then, which is symmetry allowed uh, at the nearest neighbor level, uh, takes the form where the quadrupolar order has some XY symmetric uh, interaction, but the octopolar can in general have a different coupling because it's not directly uh, related in the same way. This carries an octopole moment that forms a doublet uh, under the, uh, so, so this carries a quadrupole moment. Okay, so the phases you might say, well, I can understand the titanium. I just pick a negative sign for this. It's ferromagnetic coupling with some lambda that's smaller than one. Uh, then you can potentially use this to understand the ferro phase. Uh, whereas the antiferro phase, you would say, well, maybe the sign changes of this coupling, uh, and you can drive some kind of antiferro phase uh, of these uh, moments. Uh, but it turns out that that's actually not uh, adequate for reasons, uh, for various reasons. Uh, and I'll kind of just sketch some of them here. So for instance, one of the important uh, facts is, in fact, when you get this ferro orbital order in the titan titanium case, uh, it's known that it actually, from NMR experiments, it's known that it it picks, it, it doesn't have full XY symmetry. Actually, you have to break the XY symmetry down, and you have to favor only three of the possible angles uh, in this XY plane. Uh, and it turns out Hamiltonians, uh, which, you know, of this sort, or even ones that will generalize these kinds of two-spin interactions are basically inadequate to describe that. Okay. Uh, the second thing which is also known from, uh, from at least some kind of Landau theory, which I'll touch upon, but for which there seems to be some evidence from us, uh, ultrasound measurements with the elastic constant seems that, that any state which has antiferro quadrupolar order should have parasitic ferro quadrupolar uh, order that accompanies it. And again, that's not something that would be contained in uh, Hamiltonians of the sort. Uh, and for instance, uh, the role of you know, what these degrees of freedom do uh, is not clear. If you only focus on these quadrupolar degrees of freedom, the question is, you know, can these octopolar degrees of freedom do something more uh, interesting? Uh, and what I'd like to point out is that multiple spin exchange interactions actually provides a potential route to kind of uh, addressing all these issues. Okay. So, so let me, uh, so we can, so the way one can, uh, we are going to write this down is to start by just analyzing sort of what are the symmetries, uh, what, how do these local moments transform under various lattice symmetries? And for example, under time reversal, we know that this is odd, the Z component. And one can write down sort of various symmetries, how these moments transform under uh, lattice symmetries. And it turns out that there is actually an interesting and important uh, third order uh, three spin interaction that one can write down, uh, which involves taking three spins on the diamond lattice, which are kind of neighbor, neighbors to each other, uh, and uh, have it such that you, know, you can have all three of them appearing uh, with the tau plus. So that if I think about this in terms of you know, a U1 symmetric, some kind of bosonic theory to begin with, three particles appear and disappear, and that's an allowed process uh, in the problem. 
So, so it turns out that this is uh, useful because this is precisely the kind of term which uh, would lead to uh, ordering. So this just shows sort of Monte Carlo study of this Hamiltonian, including the two spin interactions at the classical level. And it has basically a thermal phase transition, uh, which is weakly first order as seen from this energy histogram. And it's consistent with having uh, this kind of a clock model rather than having the full XY symmetry as is expected based on this uh, form of the Hamiltonian. Uh, but, and one can sort of explicitly see this by staring at the configurations and you see that at low temperature you pick out not the full you know, manifold, but you favor uh, three of these states uh, and these are precisely consistent with uh, what NMR has uh, observed. Okay, so, you, so you favor ordering into the, into the, tau, into the tau y direction and it's uh, you know, 120 degree uh, variance of that. Uh, so, and this Hamiltonian, if one can sort of then say, well, let me kind of do a long wavelength uh, theory starting from here, and it turns out that's precisely uh, what we need, that this three-spin interaction will eventually lead to a cubic term uh, in the Landau theory that pins the uh, xy order into these uh, three angles, uh, independent of the sign of this uh, coefficient here. You pick you know, uh, three of the possible directions on the, on the surface. Uh, this problem also kind of helps with the antiferro side because if you have an antiferro quadrupolar coupling and you add this uh, cubic term, uh, it turns out it precisely produces this extra staggered, uh, this canting. So you start off with something that you think is perfectly staggered like in an antiferro magnet, but in fact, this cubic term produces a spontaneous canting uh, and produces this weak uh, parasitic uh, ferro order. Uh, so these two spins on the two sublattices no longer point exactly opposite each other, but they develop some canting uh, leading to a ferro component, which uh, seems to have been observed indirectly from, uh, as I said, from elastic constant uh, measurements. Uh, and again, one can sort of understand this uh, from a Landau theory perspective, where the, the square of the staggered moment can linearly couple to the ferro quadrupolar order. And so when you do this, then any time you produce the staggered order, you immediately drive a small parasitic uh, linear uh, coupling to the uniform component, to the ferro component. Uh, so most recently we've looked at what happens if you start generalizing this to uh, the vanadium case where you might expect as you march towards the space transition that more interactions might become important. In particular, we think that it's possible that there might be some coupling between the xy quadrupolar degrees of freedom and the Ising uh, octopolar degrees of freedom. Uh, and uh, the reason to at least kind of uh, explore this is if we sketch the phase diagram as a function of, let's say, let's say we sit here, you know, let's say the second neighbor interaction, we've explored a large window, but let's say the second neighbor interaction is small. The first neighbor interaction, let's say, is antiferromagnetic uh, in the xy, but let's turn on this four spin coupling that I just wrote down. Uh, it turns out that once you produce some xy order, uh, then this four spin coupling, if it becomes strong, can actually drive uh, Ising order of the moments to coexist. So what you can end up with are phases uh, which we tentatively think might be relevant to the vanadium compound where as you cool the system, uh, you enter from a paramagnetic phase into a phase where the quadrupolar degrees of freedom order. Uh, and when they order, they can actually drive the secondary uh, order parameter. It's not slave to this. It has to be an actual second transition where time reversal symmetry is broken. Uh, and that can give rise to a second transition shown here in sort of specific heat numerics on this Hamiltonian where uh, time reversal will be broken at the second transition. And there is some evidence for this from uh, recent magnetostriction uh, measurements uh, in, in these systems. So let me maybe spend a few minutes uh, talking about a closely related problem, uh, uh, as I mentioned, which is, you know, chiral spin liquids, which also arise from very similar uh, physics. Uh, and this is work done with my uh, student, uh, Kiran uh, Hickey, who did his PhD with me and then is now a postdoc in uh, Simon Treb's group. Uh, and this was with uh, Lucas uh, Sinchio, who was a postdoc at uh, Perimeter, and Zlatko, who was also there at that time. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of question we were asking was how interaction effects in flat bands uh, can drive interesting phases. So we kind of started thinking about a very similar problem in some sense, which was, start with some uh, problem where you, know, you want to think about this transition, a mod transition, uh, 
but in the presence of, uh, in, in band structures which might have some non-trivial uh, band topology. And uh, so, so there has been a lot of work on thinking about this physics and flat bands where the physics might have some uh, resemblance to uh, fractional quantum Hall effect in Landau levels. Uh, but we were asking a, a question which is uh, related to thinking about something like the Haldane model where you have churn number one and minus one, so it's like a lattice version of the quantum hall. Uh, and you imagine filling up the lower band with spin up and spin down uh, so that you're at a filling of one particle per site, or one electron per site, and ask what happens to the Mott insulator, uh, you know, what happens as you start cranking up interaction. So you start with something that has a quantum hall effect with two e square over h, and you want to drive up interactions to go into the Mott phase, uh, just like, you know, so it's some kind of a metal insulator transition of some sort. And again, you want to ask what happens to the magnetism uh, in the vicinity of this uh, transition. Uh, and there have been a lot of suggestions for what kind of phases would appear based on uh, analogies with, you know, particles in, in Landau levels. Uh, and one expectation is that one should find some kind of a spin liquid phase, a chiral spin liquid, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which might be stabilized uh, in the system in the, in the MOT regime. So, so we started to look at this model, and one way to kind of think about this is to again do uh, what I mentioned earlier. So of course, if, if you're at very large U, very uh, you know, deep in the MOT phase, uh, two spin interactions dominate the physics, and that'll just give rise to some kind of effective J1, J2 Hamiltonian on the honeycomb lattice. Uh, but once U becomes, you know, once U gets close, uh, you know, gets smaller so that you're being driven uh, into the conducting phase, uh, progressively higher spin interactions will become important. And the next important leading term that uh, plays a role here uh, is a term that involves the scalar uh, spin chirality. Uh, so, so what you can do then is you can ask, well, I can start asking this question both from the strong coupling perspective and from just doing mean field theory of this fermion Hamiltonian. You can ask, well, what are the phases you find uh, in the system? Uh, and in both cases, we find that uh, in contrast to a simple, uh, not simple, but, but a chiral spin liquid phase, what we find are magnetically ordered states uh, from both these approaches. And it's an interesting uh, magnetic order, so it's this what's called a tetrahedral uh, state. So it's a non-coplanar state of these spins, uh, which arranges uh, in this manner. So all the green points here would have spins pointing along this direction. Uh, red points correspond to a different spin direction. So overall, the, the magnetic state, uh, you break spin rotational symmetry, uh, but you order into this non-coplanar uh, state of these uh, spins. Okay? Uh, so in fact, you don't find, at least in the simple model, uh, we don't find a a uh, spin liquid phase, but we find something that's very close in some sense because this has large uh, spin chirality. Uh, and in many ways, this is almost liquid-like in the sense if I look at any correlation function that doesn't directly involve this broken spin rotational symmetry, it's perfectly uniform across the lattice. So if you look at nearest neighbor spin correlations, it would be uh, equal on all three neighboring bonds. Or if you look at any uh, spin, multi-spin correlations, for example, they all respect all the lattice symmetries. Uh, except uh, time reversal, uh, and, and so, uh, so, so now uh, what we asked ourselves is can one sort of then just imagine melting this order, right? So it's a non-coplanar state, it has large chirality, the only problem is that it's actually uh, magnetically ordered, uh, but it turns out you can sort of perturb the system very gently. So imagine we have these two spins that are parallel, we turn on a very small antiferromagnetic coupling that would tend to kind of take these spins which are lined up and, you know, try to disallow that. Uh, and it turns out that as you keep cranking up this third neighbor coupling, you can actually drive this tetrahedral order uh, into this chiral spin liquid, which I was uh, mentioning. Okay? And evidence for this uh, comes partly from exact diagonalization uh, studies, where you see that there is this, on this torus geometry, there's an isolated uh, doublet, which is what you expect for the new equal to half uh, Laughlin liquid uh, of bosons, which is what this uh, state is. Uh, related to, and there is also additional evidence from DMRG looking at the edge entanglement spectrum uh, showing that this is an SU2 level one uh, uh, edge theory that comes out from looking at the entanglement spectrum within DMRG. Uh, so, so this idea then we thought, okay, how general is this idea, right? So can one take these non-coplanar states and imagine, you know, disordering them by frustration and quantum fluctuations, can one disorder them? And is that a way to actually access spin liquids that people have found uh, in other uh, lattice geometries. And we find that, in fact, uh, 
uh, it's, it seems to be very uh, generic. So, so in particular, we are aided by this very nice uh, work by uh, Greg Baumist, which uh, Laura Messio and uh, Claire, where, where uh, they classified uh, what they call regular magnetic orders. So you look at you know, all possible classical magnetic orders on different uh, lattices, and you ask that, they sh that this magnetic order should be such that if you do any lattice operation, followed by uh, spin uh, rotations, and they took spin inversion, but that's not a real symmetry in the quantum case. But so let's, if we restrict ourselves to asking which magnetic orders are such that if you do a lattice transformation followed by some global spin rotation, then the state is left invariant. Okay, so this is in some sense a classical analog of uh, PSG type constructions where you, know, you want to say, well, you want to do some operations on uh, your spartons, uh, and then follow it up with some gauge transformation. This is kind of an analog of that in the classical problem in some sense. Okay, and so, so they have classified all these regular states, uh, and the simplest one, for example, you know, might be a ferromagnet or a state like this, a collinear a nail antiferromagnet. These would be examples of regular orders. Uh, but if you look at the non-coplanar uh, orders, in fact, it turns out that there are very few. So in particular, there is a single one on each of these lattices. So if you look at the honeycomb lattice, uh, the Kagame and the triangular, it turns out that there's a single non-coplanar order that is a regular uh, magnetic order. And uh, we now have uh, numerical uh, evidence. So we had numerical evidence on the honeycomb, which I showed you earlier. Uh, there is work from uh, Andreas Laukli looking at a very closely related problem on the triangular lattice uh, more recently. Uh, and they also find that they can sort of drive this transition here using second neighbor coupling between a very similar tetrahedral phase uh, and a spin liquid uh, on the triangular lattice, which is this, uh, like this calmia laughlin type liquid, but with uh, SU2 uh, symmetry. And uh, we also have you know, some diagonalization and DMRG on this, uh, again pointing to uh, this connection between this ordered state and the spin liquid. And more recently with Simon, uh, I've been doing some variational Monte Carlo calculations showing that something very similar happens on the Kagame, where you start with an octahedral state where spins point towards uh, you know, the, the various spin axes, plus minus x, plus minus y, plus minus z, that's again a regular uh, non-coplanar order, and you can drive it uh, into the chiral spin liquid, which was uh, initially one, one of the first chiral spin liquids that people had found in uh, DMRG studies. Uh, so it looks like, you know, there, uh, that, that it's, it's probably like a very generic uh, mechanism that you can start with these non-coplanar uh, magnetic orders, and either by frustration, you know, materials you might imagine, if you have a non coplanar order, maybe you apply pressure or tune something to actually drive the system uh, into, uh, into this uh, chiral spin liquid phase. Uh, and we are still thinking about some aspects of this uh, phase transition between these ordered phases and, and the spin liquid phases. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, conclude and uh, put up my summary here. So, so, so one, uh, generic, you know, one general uh, you know, message to take away from the first part might be that these multi-spin interactions, which I mentioned in the context of heavy fermions, might actually be generically important to think about, especially if you're, you know, driving your heavy fermion system close to a transition uh, into, the, into the large Fermi surface state, then such multi-spin couplings might give rise to interesting uh, ordered phases, or maybe even spin liquid phases. Uh, uh, and then in, in, in these uh, chiral spin liquids, it turns out that one can view uh, them fruitfully as having descended from uh, various types of non-coplanar phases. So that, uh, thank you for your attention.